Good, I'm happy to be here too. Um, like Dr. Prince said, um, I'm Brock Adams. I teach over at the Spartanburg campus. I teach uh, composition to freshmen. And the main reason that we're doing these sessions is because um, I, as a teacher, have talked to all the other teachers, and we seem to see the same kind of problems again and again uh, with writing from our students. And what we've tried to do is figure out the major problems that people are coming across and kind of design a crash course to address most of them uh, over the course of three lessons. Tonight, y'all are getting the tail end uh, of the course in which we're going to talk about uh, integrating sources into your paper, documenting them effectively, um, and also we're going to have another section where we talk about planning and organizing a paper. Now, what class is this? Team Theory. <laughs> team what? Team, team, team Theory. 410 Engineering Team Theory. Okay, so the stuff I teach you may be only tangentially related to uh, exactly what you do. Yes, oh, no, sir. This, they're, they're doing writing in this class. Okay, so. great. Fantastic. Um, so hopefully everything that I teach will be useful for this specific class. It will certainly be useful for any time that you have to write a paper, uh, any time that you have to do research, stuff like that. So we're going to go ahead and start off with this idea of integrating sources into your paper and make sure you're documenting them correctly, making sure uh, you're giving appropriate credit to the people that the source is coming from. So first of all, what do we put sources in our papers for? Why do we put these things in our papers? To reference. To reference what? The material that you're using. Yeah, to reference the material. We want to make sure we're referencing other sources, but why? Why might we need to reference other people? It's not our work. Yeah, absolutely. If you're putting something in there that's not your work, you need to give people credit, right? So why are we bringing things that's not our work into our papers? Show more credibility of what we're talking about. Credibility could absolutely be one reason. What's another reason? I'll give you some reasons. How about that? Yeah. Um, now, he's got one of them, credibility, but there's several reasons we might bring sources into our papers. First of all, um, you might want to bring in background information or context about whatever it is that you're talking about. Now, depends on who your audience is when you're writing a paper, your audience may not necessarily know everything that you know about a particular subject, so you, you may need to kind of bring them up to speed on it. In order to do that, you may need to explain some things, and a lot of times the best explanations come not necessarily from you, but from other people who have talked about whatever that topic is. So explaining things from their point of view can often be a great way to bring the audience up to speed. You can also do it to explain terms or concepts. It can get old if again and again you're defining words by saying according to dictionary.com, whatever the definition is. If you want to explain terms and concepts, having a variety of sources in there to kind of speak for you can be very effective. Um, and it can also be used to support your claims. Now this kind of goes hand in hand um, with, I'm sorry, what was your name? Joe. With what Joe was saying, with lending a little bit of authority to your argument, to give you some credibility. We call that ethos. Maybe you've heard of ethos, pathos, and logos. We don't have to learn that stuff tonight. But ethos is basically any time you're trying to add authority to an argument. When you bring other sources in to support claims that you're trying to make, it shows people that, hey, it's not just me saying this stuff. Other people out there, other respectable, credible people agree with me and have said these things before. By citing them, it shows that you've done your research and that other people can back you up. There's other times in arguments that you might need to bring up people who disagree with you. Well, by bringing in actual sources that disagree with them and then refuting their claims, it shows that not only do you have support for your argument, but you're ready to shoot down the arguments of actual other people. So there's lots of reasons that we might want to bring sources into our papers, and there's basically three ways we can get sources in there. We can summarize or paraphrase, which is kind of what we talked about in session one. It's where you take other people's ideas and you work them into your paper in your own voice, or you can quote, which is obviously where you take people's words and put them directly into your paper exactly as they left that person's mouth or exactly as they appeared in the person's original document. Um, quotes are what we're mostly going to be focusing on tonight, but we'll deal a little with paraphrases and summaries as well. So we're going to have two key concepts that we work with when we deal with this idea of integrating sources into your paper. We've got bookends and we've got sandwiches. Now, right now, that probably doesn't make any sense, but in a few minutes, you're going to know exactly what a bookend is, you're going to know exactly what a sandwich is, and these two things are going to help you remember every single time you bring a source into your paper uh, to integrate it properly and to document it properly. So, the reason for this, that we have these two things, bookends and sandwiches each serve a specific purpose. Bookends exist to help you make sure that you avoid accidentally plagiarizing. Bookends are there to make sure you're giving appropriate credit. 
Sandwiches, on the other hand, are there for use when we're using quotes to make sure that the quote fits smoothly into the paper. So we'll go ahead and start with bookends. Now, we're not going to talk about plagiarism that's outright cheating. If you're plagiarizing by going to websites and just copying and pasting stuff to your paper, or if you're going to freepapers.com, or if you're getting your roommate to write your paper for you, that's a whole other problem that you can deal with in another class. You probably shouldn't be in college anyway. But there is a lot of plagiarism that happens by accident, and that's what we're going to learn to avoid tonight. So the most common plagiarism happens by accident, and it's in these different ways. Sometimes people put quotes or borrowed ideas in their papers and forget to give credit. If you forget to give credit, even if it's just an accident, you're still technically plagiarizing. So we want to make sure we avoid that. If you take a quote and don't put it in quotation marks, so basically you're using somebody else's language but claiming it's your own, that's accidental plagiarism. If you have a summary or a paraphrase, but it's not really in your own words, it sounds a whole lot like the original, well, that's another example of accidental plagiarism. We have to avoid these things and make sure we're giving credit when credit's due through the use of our bookends and also through our quotes. So, here's a question. If we are using a source's ideas, but we're not using his words, we put it in our own words, do we need to give him credit? Yes, absolutely. A lot of my students will say, but I wrote this, I came up with these words, why should I have to give credit? Well, yeah, it may be your words, but you're taking someone else's ideas. If you don't give it credit, you're claiming that you came up with whatever those ideas are. That's a form of plagiarism. So paraphrases and summaries, even though they're your words, you still have to give credit to the source. So in order to pro properly document summaries, paraphrases, things like that, we have to do a few things. Now, do you guys use MLA or APA format? APA. APA? Okay. The two are very similar, so I'm going to go over MLA first, and then I'll talk about APA. So basically what goes for MLA will go for APA as well, uh, with just a couple of minor changes. So when you see MLA, just remember what you're seeing here, and then make a couple of little changes that are necessary when you get to the APA part. So, um, we'll do MLA first. You've got three things you have to do. Whenever you bring information from an outside source into your paper, you need to introduce it with a signal phrase. That signal phrase is going to name the author and give a little bit of information about that guy. You might also call these things in-text citations, or you might hear them called in-text citations. After we give a signal phrase, we'll have the actual material, the quote, the paraphrase, the summary, or whatever it is, and at the end of it, we're going to have the page number in parentheses to indicate where in the paper that it comes from. The last thing we're going to have is a work cited page that's going to give all the relevant information about the source. Uh, the title, the author, the publisher, the publishing city, the date, all that stuff. In APA format, we call that a references page. MLA is works cited, APA is references. It's kind of uh, apples and oranges, same sort of deal. Now, the reason we call it bookends is because you want to imagine every time you're bringing a quote, paraphrase, or summary into your paper that you're putting bookends around that piece of information. So we've got two bookends, and we've got some books here in the middle. Well, these things correspond with your signal phrase, the thing that introduces uh, the text that's coming up. The books are the text itself, and then the parenthetical citation is the other bookend. Now, the one more thing you have to have is the works cited entry or the references. If you have all three of those things, you know that you've given appropriate credit. If you leave one of those three things out, or certainly if you put zero of those three things, you might be treading into the territory of accidental plagiarism. So remember bookends every time you put a quote in there, or a paraphrase, or a summary. So here's an example. This comes from uh, Rules for Writers by Diana Hacker. Legal scholar Jay Keeson points out that the law holds employers liable for employees' actions such as violations of copyright laws, the distribution of offensive or graphic sexual material, and the illegal disclosure of confidential information. So, if we're thinking in terms of bookends and the text itself, what's our first bookend? Legal scholar, Jay, his name? Keeson, yeah, well, whatever he is, Kesson, Keeson, I don't really know. Um, but the first bookend is the signal phrase, right? So, legal scholar, Jay Keeson. Then we've got a paraphrase. We've got a lot of information. It sounds like it's probably most of the details that were in the original text, but this author has chosen not to quote it. This person has chose to put it in his own voice, even though he's using Jay Keeson's ideas. So the last bookend would be what? Yeah, 
page number. The page number, right. So bookend one, bookend two, and the stuff in the middle. And don't forget, you've got to have your entry on the works cited page or in the references page as well. So, the first bookend, remember, is the signal phrase. Let's talk about what goes in a good signal phrase. It's going to have several things. A good signal phrase is going to always have the author's name. And usually the first time we mention an author, we mention that person by his full name. So, J. Keeson. It's probably going to have something about that author's credentials. Why do we want to put the author's credentials in there? It shows he has authority. Mm-hmm. Shows he has authority, right. If we just said Jay Keeson, you might be like, who's Jay Keeson? Is he just some blogger who lives in his mom's basement? We don't know. But if we know he's a legal scholar, well, now he has a lot more weight to whatever words we take from him. Um, a lot of times, you'll mention the source that he comes from. Not always. You know, there may be times when uh, just a person has enough credibility on his own that we don't need to necessarily mention the source. Like in that previous example, we didn't say Jay Keeson claims in his book whatever. But a lot of times you'll go ahead and say the book or the article or whatever that comes from. And then we'll have a good signal verb. Now what you're doing with this signal phrase is you're basically alerting your audience that there's getting ready to be a slight change in the paper. So far, it's been your words. It's been your ideas. Everything that you've said has come from your brain. But when you give us this signal phrase that includes this stuff, it's like a red flag to the audience. And the audience is saying, oh, okay, this stuff that's getting ready to come up is someone else's ideas, I shift gears, I know that this guy has given appropriate credit. So, here's an example with the things highlighted to make it real easy. Joe Smith, a popular columnist for the New York Times, discusses the issue in his recent article, The Healthcare Debate. Smith claims, and so you can see, author's name is pink, credentials, a popular columnist for the New York Times, we got that in blue, the source, uh, The Healthcare Debate, is in green, and then we've got a signal verb, claims in orange. That is a really good listing of credentials. It makes sure we know exactly who this guy is, why we should listen to him. Now, signal verbs are an important thing to pay attention to because we have a lot of signal verbs that we can choose. A lot of people tend to end up saying says or according to again and again and again. So we see Smith says, Smith says, according to Smith, Smith says. Well, what's the problem with that? It could be redundant, right? It gets old. Any other problems? It sounds like you're not agreeing with what with that person's statement. Like you're just basing it off what they say, not your own name. Yeah, rather than choosing specific words that are going to indicate whether you agree with him, whether you disagree, or whether he agrees or disagrees with you, by just using all that same says again and again, it's hard to tell where he stands in relation to you or in relation to the argument, right? So we want to have better signal verbs for precision's sake and also to avoid that monotony, that redundancy that he was talking about. So look at all the different signal verbs we can use. And this is, of course, just a small list. There's probably a hundred different verbs that you could use to introduce uh, quotes, paraphrases, and summaries. Admits, agrees, argues, believes, claims, all the way down to reasons, reports, suggests, and thinks. Well, every one of these words has a slightly different meaning. So if we say, he's an admits, well, it's like he's, okay, he's willing to concede a little something. If he declares, well, then that's like he's just saying, yes, this is absolutely true. So each one has a slightly different shade of meaning, and we want to make sure we choose the signal verb for every signal phrase that's appropriate for whatever idea we're trying to get across. So you introduce the source. We start with legal scholar Jay Keeson, da-da-da-da-da. After we've introduced him, do we need to give all that information again? No. Right. What do we call him from then on out? Keeson, we just call him by his last name, right? So we had that example before. Joe Smith, a columnist for the New York Times, da 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 da. No, we don't need all that information again. It would get real wordy real fast if you stuck all that in a bunch of times. So from then on, you just call him Smith. Do not call him by his first name. You'd be amazed how many times I see this. Joe believes, Joe claims. Well, you don't know Joe. Joe's not your buddy. You need to do him the professional courtesy of treating him, you know, as a respectable adult. You'll refer to him as Smith. The only exception is if you have somebody like Oprah or uh, Beyonce or somebody like that who's pretty much always known by a first name. Well, you would say Oprah believes, Oprah claims instead of Winfrey. But 99% of the people on earth are not Oprah. So uh, you'll just go ahead and call them by their last name. 
So we've dealt with the first bookend. The last one is the parenthetical citation. Now, when you do MLA format, there is no P or PP in there. When you do AP, as you'll see in just a minute, you do put that stuff in there. So, here's the example. Legal scholar Jay Keeson points out that the law holds employers liable, and then we have 312 in parentheses. And notice that the period is on the outside of this parenthetical citation. What would happen if we put the period in here instead? What would that mean about this 312? You're referencing the next sentence of your uh... Exactly. It'd be the beginning of the next sentence. Yeah. So we need to pay attention and make sure we put the period on the outside of the parenthetical uh, citation. A lot of people forget that. Also, why didn't we say keys in 312? Sorry, let's already listed his name in the sentence, exactly. In our signal phrase, we said legal scholar Jay Keeson. So it would be redundant to say it again in the parenthetical citation. Now, if you put some information in there for one reason or another without using a signal phrase, which most of the time you want a signal phrase, but you may have the occasional uh, instance where you just put some information in there without mentioning his name, then you'd go ahead and put Keeson or whatever in the parenthetical citation. But most of the time you'll have a signal phrase and you can just put the page numbers. Now, it is important to remember that you have to follow your specific rules. So you guys, if you're using APA format, maybe you have this book or a book like it. Or maybe you have a website where you can go uh, to find the information to do things in appropriate APA format. It's real important that you know what your style guide is. Now, I don't know why we have to have so many different styles. I mean, we've got APA, we've got MLA, AP, Chicago. Are there any other ones? Turabian's an old one. Turabian. So at least like five different style guides. I think that probably just all the different companies like to sell their books. And that's probably why we have all the different ones. Um, but you need to know which one is yours. You need to make sure you stick to your rules. So we mentioned sources introduced in the signal phrase and the author. That's the in-text citation. Uh, we've got the page number afterwards. And we've got to remember to have the works cited entry attached to it. So this is what a works cited entry for that particular source would look like in MLA format. Now, we're not going to go into all the nitty-gritty of how to do things uh, in correct MLA format or APA format for a works cited or a references page, just because it's too detailed and there's too much of it. And honestly, it's not important that you memorize how to do any of this stuff. You're going to have your style guide. You're going to be able to look up how to do the format whenever you need to. I can't imagine any teacher would give you a test that required you to write out a works cited or a references page from memory. So you'll always have your style guide there. Just make sure you know how to use your style guide. But you'll notice it has the author's name, the title, the journal it appeared in, page numbers. Usually you're going to have information like that required on your works cited or references page. Now, APA format, which you guys are using, going to be pretty similar. You're still going to want all three things, uh, the signal phrase, the um, parenthetical citation, and the entry on the references page. There's just a couple of changes. Um, a year of publication goes in the signal phrase, and you put P in the parenthetical citation. With MLA, it was just the number. With APA, you put the P in there. Again, I don't know why they have to be different, but they are. So here's an example in APA format. Yanofsky and Yanofsky, and then you see we have 2002. So we go ahead and say the year that this thing was published. I think probably the reason for this is that if this is the American Psychological Association, that's what APA is, right? Yeah, American Psychological Association. Well, Yanofsky and Yanofsky, as psychologists or whatever they do for a living, have probably published lots of things. So we want to go ahead and put in the signal phrase the year that they did this particular experiment to kind of give a little context and so we know specifically which source this is. They explain that uh, sibutramine suppresses appetite by blocking the reuptake of the neurotransmitters serotonin and norepinephrine in the brain. And then we have page 594. You have multiple pages, it's this PP period. Easy, right? And then the references page is a lot like the works cited page, but again, it has a slightly different format. So that's what it's going to look like. You can see it's still got all the same information, the names, the year, uh, the title of the article, the title of the journal, and the page numbers. Just make sure you know what format you're using and you know uh, how to find it in your style guide. Okay, so we've been talking so far about giving appropriate credit for borrowed ideas. What we've said before counts for summaries, paraphrases, and quotes. What we've talked about so far is how to make sure we avoid plagiarism. Now, there's one more step we have to take to make sure we avoid plagiarism if we're quoting. 
If we've got borrowed words, well, it works a little differently. So let's say, here's uh, something we're trying to write into our paper. Martin Luther King Jr. hoped for a land in which people would not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the contact, content of their character. Is that all right? See people kind of shaking their heads. Why wouldn't that be okay? It's a word-for-word word quote. Word for word quote, right? This is one of the most famous speeches ever given. So you're not going to get away with putting word-for-word word stuff from Martin Luther King's speech into your paper without putting any quotes. If we put that blue thing in there without putting any quotes, what are we implying? That those are our words, right? We're implying that we came up with this uh, color of their skin, but by the content of their character, which of course we did not. Martin Luther King came up with it, and everybody knows it. Now, somebody who wrote this is probably not trying to cheat. They're not trying to rip off Martin Luther King, but they're doing it by accident anyway, and it is technically plagiarism. So when we have borrowed words, they've got to appear in quotations. So it would look like this. Hope for a land in which the people would, and then quote the part from the speech. Notice that we still have a page number uh, with a period. We still have our bookends in addition to the quotes to make sure we're giving credit for the ideas and credit for the words. Notice that the quotation mark is inside the parenthetical citation. What would imply, what would be implied if the quotation mark was right here? That he quoted the page. Right, that he said, that Martin Luther King said, not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character, 13. Which of course makes no sense at all. So we got to make sure we do our little punctuation marks correctly too, or it gets confusing. So you give credit for any ideas using the bookends. You give credit for words using bookends and the quotation marks. Now, to make sure we do the quotation marks and uh, for the quotes and to integrate the quotes correctly into our papers, we use the quote sandwich. This is one of the most useful things to remember uh, when you're writing a paper to make sure you integrate these quotes smoothly. I know it's around dinner time, and every time I see these sandwiches, I start to get hungry. I've got several sandwiches in here. But hopefully it'll help you remember. So, the quote sandwich. I see the same problems again and again with quoting from my students. So the quote sandwich is designed to help fix these problems. With my students, and probably with a lot of you guys, you're pretty good. Students are pretty good at finding good quotes. They can look through their uh, text that they're reading and go, ooh, this is a really good thing that's going to be really useful. I want to work it into my paper somehow. The problem is they have a hard time using it correctly. They know they want to use it, but they're not quite sure how to work it into the paper. Um, when we put a quote into the paper, we got to know some stuff about it. We got to make sure we know where that quote comes from, and we got to know how it actually relates to the paper. So let me show you an example. Barack Obama was elected president of the United States on November 3rd, 2008. The election of Barack Obama represents a breakthrough in the struggle of the African American in society. Barack Obama took office on January 20th, 2009. What is the matter with that paragraph? No reference to what? To the original work. No reference to the original work, right? Where did that quote come from? We don't know, right? It's not in there. What else is wrong with it? No ties to your argument. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily tie into your argument at all. It just goes straight from this quote to the next sentence. This is what we call a hit and run quote. Basically, the reason we call it a hit and run quote is because it's like the student's cruising along, he's writing his paper, and then bam, all of a sudden he hits you with a quote, and then he just moves on. Hit and run. He doesn't bother to tell you where the quote comes from, doesn't bother to tell you what it means, all he does is hits you with the quote and moves on. Other people might call it a dropped quote because it's like they've just got some quotes and they're just kind of scattering them in the paper to make sure the uh, professor sees that they've gone out and done some research. That's not what we want to do. Here's the breakdown. We've got the first sentence. Well, that's a good statement. Gives us some information about who Obama is. That works. Now we've got the quote. Well, that's a good quote. I can see that the student did some research and found something that's going to fit well into the paper. But like we said, we don't know where it comes from. There's no reference, uh, or you know, no reference to the original source. And then we get this: Barack Obama took office on January 20th, 2009. So I'm like, whoa, okay, you gave us that quote, and then you just move on. We have no idea what the significance of that quote was. We have no idea why you bothered to put it in the paper. You can't just put quotes in there for fun. You got to put them in there for some sort of a reason. So this is where the sandwich comes in. I guess this is a Chick-fil-A sandwich. It looks pretty good, too. 
any sandwich has three layers, right? You got bread, you got meat, and you've got bread. I guess if you're a vegetarian, it could be bread, vegetables, bread, or bread, cheese, whatever. The point is, sandwiches have three layers, right? So the quote sandwich is going to have three layers too. The first piece of bread is the introduction to the quote. Who said it? What are his credentials? Where was it published? And you'll notice that the first piece of bread is real similar to the first bookend. So a lot of times you can kind of merge your bookends and your uh, quote sandwiches to make just one big bookend sandwich uh, that will cover everything. The meat is the quote itself. We make sure that it's in quotation marks to give credit that those are somebody else's words, not just somebody else's ideas. And we put the appropriate citation at the end to make sure that we're uh, having our second book in to give credit. The last piece of bread is something that you don't necessarily always do with a summary or paraphrase, but we make sure we always do with a quote. The last piece of bread is the explanation. It tells us what the quote means if it's difficult to understand. So say you're writing... Um, you know, something for a medical class of some sort, and you bring some technical medical terminology in there, well, your audience may not get everything. You may need to put it into layman's terms and, or something like that. And so the explanation of the quote can say, all right, this is what the person means. Now, basically, what so-and-so is saying is, and then you explain it in layman's terms. You also want to make sure we know how the quote relates to your paper and how it either supports or refutes your argument. That's probably the most important thing. We work it in there in such a way that it feels like an organic part of the paper, something that actually serves a purpose rather than just the hit and run quote. So here's an improved version of our original thing. Barack Obama was elected president of the United States on November 3rd, 2008. James Smith, a popular political author, comments on the history-making event in his book, The Dawn of the Obama Era. He claims, the election of Barack Obama represents a breakthrough in the struggle of the African American in society. Smith is right. When Barack Obama took office on January 20, 2009, he tore down a wall that had long stood between African Americans and political success. This author and book, by the way, I just made up, so don't go out and try and find this book. It doesn't exist. Um, but anyway, this is a much better version. What we've done here, we now have the three pieces of the quote sandwich. Brett introduces the quote. We've got James Smith. We've got his uh, credentials. He's a popular political author. We've got his book, The Dawn of the Obama Era. And then we have a signal verb, he claims. And we have the meat of the quote. We put it in quotes, the election of Barack Obama, da 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 da. We give the page number to make sure we've got our last book in, given credit. Um, and then we have the last piece of bread. Smith is right. Okay, Smith has somehow supported our argument. When Barack Obama took office on January 20th, 2009, so we still got our original information in there, he tore down a wall that had long stood between African Americans and political success. So we can tell that this paper is going to talk a little bit about, you know, the advancements that have been made in society, um, partially symbolized by Barack Obama being elected. Um, and we can tell how this quote is essential to getting that point across. So now, the actual, the entire paragraph feels like an organic, uh, nicely integrated work in a paper, as opposed to just this random quote jammed in there for fun. Now, you may be thinking, okay, there's times to summarize, there's times to paraphrase, and there's times to quote. In the session one, we talked about, okay, you might want to paraphrase if you want to put something in your own words, but you want to keep all the details. We said you might want to summarize if you want to put something in your own words and just get the main idea. Well, quoting is useful for other purposes. Say you got especially vivid or expressive language, like when we gave our example with the Martin Luther King speech. Well, you don't want to start trying to put the Martin Luther King speech, the I Have a Dream speech, into your own words. It's already one of the most famous, eloquent speeches ever written. Why would you want to try and change it? You don't want to reinvent the wheel. It's already pretty great. Put it in there in the original form. If exact wording is needed for technical accuracy, you're afraid if you put something in there and try to put it in your own words, you might give it a slightly different shade of meaning. Put it in there as it was originally published. We'll make sure you're 100% technically accurate. Same thing goes for if it's important to let the debaters make sure they are set, uh, stating their own positions and to make sure that your position is never confused with the position of one of your sources. Um, I had a girl and she was writing an argument paper about, uh, I think, interracial marriage. And she was trying to get sources from lots of different points of view. And she actually found an article that had been written by the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan. And so, of course, it was big time anti-interracial data. But she didn't want there to be any chance that people read that and thought that was her point of view. 
She made it real clear, this is not my point of view, this is this other racist guy's point of view. So by putting it in quotes, it was always clear when he was talking versus when she was talking. Also, when we mentioned, uh, I think it was Joe mentioned, we might bring stuff into our paper to add ethos, to add uh, credibility. Well, if you have an important authority that can lend weight to an argument, go ahead and put his words. If we are talking about science, and we have a quote from Stephen Hawking that confirms your argument, well, if you have the words that came out of the smartest man in the world's mouth exactly as they appeared, well, then that adds a whole lot of credibility to whatever it is that you're saying. So those are some good reasons to quote as opposed to summarizing or paraphrasing. So, when it comes to making sure that you get the sources into your paper appropriately in such a way that you don't plagiarize and that you always give appropriate credit, you only really got the two things to remember. You've got your bookends, you've got your sandwiches. So, anytime it's ideas that are not your own, you've got to remember the bookends. You've got to give appropriate credit. Anytime it's words that are not your own, you've got to be like Dagwood here. Dagwood says, I know my sandwiches. Well, you've got to know your sandwiches too. If you put everything in quote sandwiches, the quotes will be smoothly integrated, you'll give appropriate credit, it'll sound really good, and you'll avoid those hit and run quotes that are so problematic. Any questions about uh, the quoting, the documenting, the integrating sources into your papers? I did such a great job that I covered everything. Okay, well let's go ahead and talk about uh, the second half of the little lesson tonight. Um, I basically am shifting gears here and talking about something a little different. Um, we focused on, we kind of covered all the actual writing of the paper. In the first session we talked about how to read and how to get uh, good information from your sources to work into the paper. First half of tonight we talked about how to get that information into the paper and how to cite it correctly. Uh, the last session we talked about punctuation, spelling, and grammar. Tonight, the second half, we're really going to work on the process of getting started the planning and organizing a paper before you actually start writing this thing. Now, here's a professor that looks really frustrated. This is what I and some of your other professors probably look like a lot when we see your papers, because we, a lot of us, have the same complaints. A lot of our students do not do any planning before they start writing. They basically just sit down, they turn on the computer and look at the Word document, and they just say, okay, what should I write? And they just start typing, and they type until they've got three pages or five pages or whatever they're supposed to have. This leads to pretty bad papers, but a lot of students don't plan, even though it does lead to these bad papers. Now, I was guilty of this too when I was in college. Now when I write, I try and do a little more planning. I always teach my students to do it, but don't feel you know, too bad if you don't plan. But just be aware that it can do a lot for your paper. And one of the reasons students don't like to plan it's because they're worried it's going to take too much time. They just say, I just want to sit down and get it done. Well, the kind of secret about planning for your paper is that it doesn't actually add any time. It just redistributes the time. It redistributes the work that you're going to have to put into it. Um, basically, it's going to take longer to get started if you're spending a lot of time planning and organizing. But once you actually start writing this thing, it's going to take a lot less time to write because you've got this plan, because you've already got an idea laid out. So you might sit down at your computer with no plan, and it takes you four hours to draft this whole thing. However, if you spend two hours planning, and then two hours actually writing it, you've still spent four hours, but the end result is going to be way, way better. So you've got to decide how you want to spend your time. I'm not going to tell you planning takes less time, because it doesn't, but it really doesn't take that much more. Allocate your time appropriately, and you'll end up with a better paper. So when it comes to planning, we basically got four things we want to do before we actually sit down to start writing to make sure we've considered everything that we need to consider uh, in order to write a good paper. We're going to assess the writing situation, form a research question, research your topic from several different points of view. Now, this depends on what class you're in and what your paper is going to require, but a lot of papers are going to require you not just to consider things from whatever point of view you come from, but also from other people's points of view as well. And you're going to draft a working thesis. This is all stuff you do before you really even start uh, you know, drafting the paper or even organizing the paper. This is just kind of pre-writing stuff that's going to get you ready to go. We'll talk about each one of these individually. So, was anybody here for session one? I don't think I... Tim was here for session one, yeah. <laughs> and our uh, recorder, yeah. What was your name again? David. Dave, yeah. Dave and Tim are our uh, veterans of the professional writing skills program. So, they remember this stuff. 
basically, when it comes to session one, we talked about the things that you need to think about when you're doing your reading. And one of the things was, all right, this author who wrote this paper, or this essay, or whatever it is you're reading, had some stuff in mind when he sat down to write the paper. We need to understand that in order to make sure we understand what he's saying now. Subject is what the paper is about. Purpose is why that person wrote the paper. And audience is who that paper or article or book or whatever is targeted towards. And we understand that the paper can be interpreted slightly differently depending on what the answers to those three points of the triangle may be. Now, when it's time for you to write, you're the author. So you have to think about these three points of the triangle and how you're actually going to write your paper according to where you stand on subject, purpose, and audience. So, subject. Well, it depends on what your class is, right? Whatever your class is, you're going to have some subject that you have to deal with in your paper. Well, what are you writing about and what do you already know about that subject? Well, if you've been in class for a while, hopefully you've learned a decent amount of stuff and you'll be able to use that stuff as you're writing. If you haven't been in the class so long, or if you're writing about a subject you're not as familiar with, you know you're going to, be, have, you're going to have to do a little bit more research uh, to make sure you're able to write an intelligent paper. Also, you're going to need to think about different points of view. Whatever your subject is, it's likely that people don't all agree on uh, how that particular subject should be handled or addressed or whatever. You need to make sure you're able to understand the different points of view so you can address them. Purpose, again, depends on what your professor asks of you. You might be asked to write an argument paper in which the main purpose would be to try and persuade people of something. You might be asked to write a research paper, in which case the main purpose would be to inform. Uh, if you were writing a textual analysis, you would be analyzing exactly what another author does. Maybe a technical memo or something would be for communication purposes. So there could be lots of different reasons you're writing a paper. You've got to make sure you understand what your purpose is so that you frame your paper correctly and structure it appropriately. Audience is the last thing that you want to consider, but another important one. Now, don't just think, oh, I'm writing to my professor. My professor is my audience. Well, yeah, it's true that your professor might be the only person who's going to read it, but we need to uh, write these arguments or proposals or whatever they may be as though they're directed to an actual audience. So if we were writing a paper that was going to be read by college students, it would be very different than one that was going to be read by congressmen or one that was going to be read by doctors or one that was going to be read by a bunch of parents of elementary school children. So we need to make sure we know who the audience is so that we can use appropriate language, so that we can use appropriate references, so that we explain everything the way we need to explain. So we consider those three points of the triangle before we start writing, and that's assessing the writing situation. The second thing we have to do is form a research question. Basically, what the research question is going to do is kind of give you a question that you're looking for an answer to as you start doing research and as you start writing this actual paper. Um, again, you have to understand what the assignment wants you to do to come up with a good research question. So here's a couple of examples. Let's say we were going to write a paper that was maybe an argument, and we were going to write it about health care. Well, people love to debate about health care. Here's a research question. Should the government adopt a single-payer health care system? Well, remember, that's not necessarily going to be the thing we go and type into a search engine as we start doing research. But we're going to look for things to look up that can help us answer this question. And as we're finding those things, we'll notice there are some people who say, absolutely, uh, we should go single payer and have everybody taken care of. And then there's going to be other people who say, no, 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 we should let the free market uh, drive a, you know individual health care system. It'll be completely opposite points of view. So we need to think about the different points of view and what we're going to find as we research our research question. Another one. Um, are student-teacher conferences worth the time and inconvenience? Well, maybe you're writing an analytical paper on how teachers and their students interact and the best ways for a teacher uh, to improve a student's performance. Well, whether or not they should have conferences could be an important part of it, and you would need to research that. So the research question would help guide you. Once you've got your research question, it's time to actually do the research. Now, a lot of this is going to depend on what your professor requires of you. Sometimes a professor might not give you any specific source requirements at all. You might just say, write a paper. Other times your professor might be real specific. I know with the paper my students are writing right now, they've got to have like one scholarly journal, they've got to have a couple other things from the library. Uh, they're not allowed to have anything that they just Googled and you know, found online, Joe's blog or whatever. Um, not Joe's blog, but you know, Joe's blog. Um, so pay attention to what your professor wants from you. And also use whatever tools are at your disposal. So 
you probably got libraries that you can use. I know there's a library in Greenville. There's a library at the upstate campus. Um, libraries all over the place that you can use. The internet has basically everything you could possibly ever want on it. Um, also interviews. Think, is there somebody I know or can I get in touch with somebody who's going to give me good, relevant information for this topic that I'm talking about? Use whatever you have at your disposal. And then again, make sure you consider multiple points of view. Lots of my students love to write about, uh, should we legalize marijuana? And of course, most of my students are on the yes, we should legalize marijuana side. But imagine for a minute that these students start writing a paper. And they say, all right, I'm going to look at the normal website, National Organization for Legalizing Marijuana, or whatever it is. I'm going to look at High Times Magazine. I'm going to get quotes from Woody Harrelson and Bill Maher. What's the problem with that? One side of the argument. One side, exactly. We're going to hear nothing but people who are in support of legalizing marijuana. We won't get the people who are against it. So we've got to make sure we research it from lots of different points of view. The last thing we do after we've done our research and we've begun to kind of see an answer to our research question is we can draft a working thesis that's going to kind of guide our organization and ultimately help uh, actually shape our paper when it's time to write it. So the thesis should do three things. It should basically answer your research question. It should show where you stand on whatever the issue is. And this is especially important with an argumentative paper, a proposal paper, anything like that. If you're writing a more technical paper, you're still going to have some sort of main idea, but it's not going to be so much your opinion and your stance as it is uh, you know, the stance of a company or uh, maybe just some sort of statement of fact, something like that. Also, we'll show the audience where the paper is going to go. So when the audience has read your thesis statement, they should have a good idea of where the rest of this paper is going to take it. So here's a couple of thesis statements based on our questions. Remember, we had a question that was, uh, should America adopt a single-payer health care system? Well, here's a thesis statement. The success of single-payer health care systems in other nations suggests that America would benefit by adopting one as well. Well, it answers the research question, it shows where this author stands, and we have some idea of where the paper is going to go. The author's probably going to talk about other countries where it's successful and use those as examples for why they should do it in America. Here's one for the other one. Student success begins at home and the relationship between teachers and parents built in conferences is essential to fostering a home environment that is beneficial to education. Again, a thesis statement that answers the question shows where it's going to go and shows where that person stands on the issue. So once we've gotten ready to write, we've assessed the writing situation, planned, uh, researched, got a thesis statement, research questions, all that good stuff, it's time to actually organize the paper. Now at this point, You've done enough research that you've probably got a pretty good idea of how you want this paper to look already in your head. Well, the organizing part is just getting it from your head onto paper to help make it a little easier to start drafting. So I like using outlines. Everybody knows what an outline is. They can be a really, really useful way to organize a paper. When you're doing your outline, it's also useful to help break your paper into basically three main parts. And it's pretty self-explanatory, but you're going to need some sort of introduction to let the reader know what's going on. You're going to need a body where most of your paper or your argument or your inform information or whatever is found, and then a conclusion that kind of wraps everything up. So we'll talk about uh, those three things. The outline itself, again, you've seen these, you know what an outline is, so we'll just go over it quickly. Typically, you put your thesis statement at the top of the outline, and then the outline is going to be based on uh, supporting that particular thesis statement. So every one of those Roman numerals is going to be a main idea. That would probably be the main idea of a paragraph in your actual paper. And each subheading is the support for the major Roman numeral. So that would be like quotes and uh, examples and stuff that you're going to use to support the ideas in each main paragraph in your paper. So here's an example. Here's our thesis. Uh, Single-payer healthcare systems would be good because they're good in other countries. Well, maybe paragraph one, we're going to look at Switzerland. And we're going to talk about how they have uh, universal health care and a single-payer system that works real well. Well, we've got quotes from uh, the Swiss doctor, a quote from some European Union official, and an example from some article by some guy. Well, those three things are going to help us support this idea that it works well in Switzerland. We'll also talk about, look, it works well in Canada, too. We'll have another quote from this article by Jones. I just made Jones up, but, you know, he could be a doctor or something like that. And a quote from Canada's prime minister. Again, we're supporting our argument, trying to make sure that we're backing up the things that we say with good sources. And of course, we would be using our bookends and using our quote sandwiches to make sure we're giving appropriate credit. A lot of times you're going to want to bring up some people who disagree, 
people who don't think your plan is great. So, you know, Sarah Palin would probably be somebody who would be against universal health care. She just announced that she's not running for president, so we don't have to care what she says. But we would put a quote or something like that from her in there, and then probably a quote that explains why uh, her point of view is not the one that we support. So if we find another source who can refute her, that would be great. Once we've got our outline, we can start thinking in terms of, okay, how do we want to actually write this paper? Good introductions are essential. Basically, there's several things you have to do. Remember, your audience may not necessarily know much of anything about this topic, and they may not even be that interested. So you've got to do a couple things to make sure you get their attention and make sure that they want to, uh, or that they understand what's going on. So, you use a grabber to grab their attention. You know how like when you watch a horror movie or something, a lot of times before the story even starts, they'll open with like a five minute scene where somebody gets killed. You know what I'm talking about? That's there to get your attention. You see the murderer, you see the ghost or the monster or whatever right at the beginning in a kind of a mysterious way, but it makes you want to keep watching the movie to see what's going to happen. Well, the grabber is almost the same thing. You open with an interesting story, some shocking statistics, uh, surprising facts or examples, things like that. It'll make the person want to keep reading, make them want to find out what happens next. You give them background information after that. Make sure they know everything they need to know about the topic so that when you start going into it and giving them all the details, they're not sitting there going, wait a minute, I don't know enough about this to understand your argument. Give them the background information including major points of view, and usually at some point you'll also introduce your thesis so they know where you stand and they know where the paper's going to go. After that, you get to the body of the paper. That's where you support whatever it is that your thesis is. So you're probably going to have sources that confirm uh, your claims in each paragraph, or you might have sources that disagree with you. But remember, don't bring sources that disagree with you in unless you're ready to refute them and uh, explain why they're wrong. But that's what you're going to do with most of the body paragraphs. Typically, you want to open each paragraph with some sort of a topic sentence that lets you know what that paragraph is going to be about. And the topic sentences are going to be real similar to those Roman numeral things that you had in your outline. So if we had healthcare in Switzerland as a Roman numeral outline, our topic sentence is going to be something like, Switzerland has used universal healthcare for 50 years with great results. Something like that. And then we'd have our evidence to support it. In the form of quotes, paraphrases, and summaries. Your conclusion is exactly what it sounds like. The important thing here is that we reiterate our main points. Not repeat them, reiterate. So what's, what's the difference between reiterating and repeating? What does it mean to reiterate something? Yeah, almost like a summary or something, right? What would it mean to repeat something? Yeah, saying it verbatim, saying it exactly the same again. What I've actually seen people do is copy and paste their thesis statement from the first paragraph and put it in the last paragraph, too. Well, that's real redundant and real sloppy. We're going to read it, and it's only been five pages or something so, since we read it. We're going to remember it and wonder why you're saying the exact same thing again. So don't repeat yourself, but do summarize and emphasize your main ideas. You want to reiterate your main points. It'll emphasize the thesis, not repeat it, but just emphasize its importance. Remind us of key arguments that supported your thesis. And then one of the best things you can do is if you can come back to that grabber, whatever you use to get the audience's attention, if you can come back to that somehow at the end, it'll really make the paper feel like it's come full circle. So if you were writing about healthcare and you opened with an example of a sick kid who couldn't get taken care of, and then at the end you came back and said something like, if only we would adopt universal healthcare, little sick Billy uh, would be just fine. Well, we've come full circle. And of course yours would sound way better than that. I just made it up off the top of my head. But you get the point. So, with the good planning, yeah, you'll be as happy as Borat. With the good planning, you'll accomplish several things. Um, basically, we said you spend a couple hours planning, the writing is going to be a lot simpler. Because, well, you've got your writing situation all figured out. You've got your outline. Now the outline is almost like a skeleton, where all you have to do is add, you know, the meat and the skin and stuff. It's just filling in the blanks after that. You connect the main points, you add a few quotes. It's so, so simple once you've got a really good outline. It'll save you time uh, you know, in the long run. It will be much better organized, your final paper. Paper's going to be way, way better, too. Your professors will be impressed. It'll also make sure that you don't leave anything out. Sometimes if you sit down and try writing that entire paper from scratch, you're going to end up uh, you know, having some good ideas that you just plain forget as you're writing. 
If you do an outline, if you plan, you'll make sure you get all the ideas in there and you get them in a smooth, organized manner. All right, that's it. Anybody got any questions about anything that we talked about tonight? Did y'all learn something? Was that at least mildly enjoying? Okay, good. I know it's not the most exciting subject in the world, but I do hope you learned something. Thanks for having me, guys. Thank you.